If you have your Bibles, take them out with me. Open them up to Matthew chapter 13. Today is uh, the concluding series through this series that we've been on entitled Parables of God's Kingdom uh, throughout the whole month of July. I, I kind of give you just a little forward. I just got to continue to stir my heart with the various parables of Jesus. So probably next Sunday, we're going to kick back into a new series related to some of the other parables uh, that Jesus taught. But we focused this series on the parables related to God's kingdom. We kicked it off with the parable of the prodigal son. Then we jumped into Matthew 13, where we have been the rest of the time there with the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, And today is the parable of yeast, often referred to as the parable of of leaven. And I want to jump right into this this morning. Uh, Matthew 13, if you'll follow along with me, in the 33rd verse, it reads, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Verse 34, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, so was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Father, we just say thank you once again for your word. Lord, we trust in your revelation, your truth this morning. God and I, I believe that it does fall on good soil. God, and above all things, that your will would be accomplished in our life, God, through our life today, God, in the days, weeks, and months to come, Lord, until you make that choice to come back and to receive your own to your eternal destiny. Father, we pray that to be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As Jesus taught these various parables related to God's kingdom, He took little snippets, we would say, out of normal, everyday life there in the Galilean area. Things that they should have pretty easily, we would say, understood. This one is no different, the parable of the yeast, or if you refer to it as the parable of leaven, because in the Galilean area, most of those were smaller towns or villages where we recognize there was no bakery. There wasn't a, a public bakery that would bake all of the bread. So where did the bakery take place? Where did the baking take place? But in each individual home, the, the, the mom, the wife would get up and, and bake the portion of bread that was necessary for her, her own house. And we recognize Jesus had no doubt often probably seen his mother use leaven. And as just a little understanding of leaven, it was dough that had been kept from a previous baking, probably had fermented. When this leaven was mixed into this new batch of dough, they recognized that it changed the characteristics of the dough. That is, the dough rose and made full loaves of bread when it was baked they recognized that the leaven changed everything in this new batch of dough that was being prepared. And what Jesus was teaching us is like that leaven, God's kingdom likewise changes everything that it comes in contact with. The leaven changes all the characteristics, changes everything about that dough, and enables that dough to rise and become this beautiful loaf of bread. Likewise, Jesus says, God's kingdom, when it comes into contact with people, changes people's lives. Now, understand as I get into this, number one, there was a difficult interpretation for people to capture. Some would even recognize this as possibly a controversial parable. Why? Leaven mostly symbolized to the Jewish people some type of an evil influence. So why would Jesus be using leaven to identify to God's kingdom? 
In fact, elsewhere in the New Testament, Jesus advised his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and also of Herod in the Gospel of Mark. Paul twice used this phrase, a little leaven leavens the whole lot, as he exhorted Christian people to separate themselves from all things that was evil or even had the appearance of that which was evil in 1 Corinthians 5 and Galatians 5. If a Jewish proselyte relapsed into pagan ways, the rabbis would speak of them as returning to their leaven. So oftentimes in the Jewish culture, once again, leaven was looked at as something that represented evil. So why would Jesus use this as he begins to talk about or to describe the kingdom of God? Understand with me, it's not always evil. One rabbi said this was often passed along to others, great is peace when that peace is to the earth as leaven is to the dough. And we can find other portions of Scripture that would even identify that the leaven isn't always represented of evil. But if allowed, once again, this parable can become controversial in people's thoughts. The point of this parable is not whether the leaven is good or bad. Rather, it's just simply used to illustrate that the most silent of forces may be the strongest. The most silent of forces may be the strongest. Hence, I've entitled this morning's message, Silent Forces Are Often the Strongest. We often identify those loud movements, those loud forces, as because they're so loud, they must be the strongest. But if we took the time to study history, many times the strongest of forces is usually silent forces, forces we may not see and sometimes forces we may not actually hear. So I think what we would say is maybe we need to, number two, take the long look. Take the long look. I think too many people want to see their success immediately. We don't want to wait to be rewarded. We want to be rewarded instantaneously, right? But we kind of train our children that way. When they do good, we often instantaneously or we very quickly reward them. When we, they do bad, we try to bring necessary discipline as quickly as possible. So we, we grow up in this environment of believing that our reward should be an instantaneous reward. We believe that when we become a Christian, that that, that somehow that means that all of our problems are immediately solved and prosperity will show up tomorrow morning. And if it's late, it'll show up tomorrow afternoon. Right? We, we grow up with these thoughts and we oftentimes convey it to our, our, our spiritual life. Can I just share with you, this simply is not true. Of course, when we receive Jesus as the Savior of our life, the guilt of our sin is dealt with on the basis of Christ's death on Calvary and his resurrection from the grave. This should bring, I would say, immediate peace into our life, in our relationship with God, because we know that we shall not come into condemnation and that our sins are now under the blood of Jesus Christ. However, there still may be personal struggles, personal problems that will just have to be dealt with from one day to the next, from one week to the next, from one season to the next. Jesus even teaches us that. In this life, you will have troubles. But take heart. Be strong. Be courageous. Stand firm. Be patient, persevere, 
Why? Because we will overcome as long as we remain with Jesus. Once again, the glorious truth is that ultimately we have the assurance of victory. Knowing that we're going to win the game provides help in various times of need, strength from inning to inning. Anybody ever play baseball in your life? Anybody ever have a bad inning when you played baseball, maybe when you played softball? Anybody ever played football and maybe had a bad quarter? Anybody ever played basketball and have a bad quarter? Anybody in the room this morning? Anybody ever play golf and have a bad hole? Ever have just a bad round? Anybody ever played golf and it's never got good for you? I'll give you the greatest tip I can give you. It's not nothing spiritual. I'm going to give you the best. If it's never gotten good, just quit. You'll never hit another bad shot in your life. No, I'm just playing. There's going to be struggles in the midst of whatever the activity, whatever the game is. There'll be struggles in life. But if I already know I'm going to win, it's not that it's easy, but it makes persevering easier. It gives me strength to persevere because I know siding with Jesus, that side ultimately is the victorious side. The apostle John wrote to the struggling church in Asia Minor, the church in Smyrna, Catch this, the devil will cast some of you into prison. You may become tired. And you will have tribulation 10 days. He says, but be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto the end. And I will give you the crown of life. The reward's coming. Just remain steadfast. Just remain faithful. If I could paraphrase what John was saying, I would say take the long look. Do not set your life on just today. Don't set your life on just the short-term goals. Give God some time. And at the right time, God will help to work out the struggle to provide relief. In the meantime, be faithful and live up to the light that you possess. In essence, live up to the light of Jesus Christ that is inside of each one of us. May we choose, even in the days where we're struggling, even in the days of persecution, even in that moment of tribulation, yet to be the light of Jesus Christ. Take the long look. Thirdly, for you, history renders strange verdicts. We'll get back to this parable in just a moment, but hang with me. Once again, history renders strange verdict. Anybody alive in 1809 by chance? Anybody like history? I, I, I love history. Some of y'all probably like history more than me. In 1809, if you'd have been alive, you'd have been tempted to join a group of pessimists who referred to 1809 as the world's darkest hour. Everything that was going on in that world seemed to identify that this world had no future hope. Europe was on the borderline of complete frustration, ready to throw in the towel and to call it quits. Napoleon Many of you know that individual. Napoleon was dominating the entire continent and yet still making plans for further conquest. The cause of freedom and social progress literally seemed hopeless. The truth is, however, that God was yet still at work. For it was in that year, in the year of 1809, I'll just name a few, Abraham Lincoln was born, William Gladstone was born, Alfred Tennyson was born, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born, Cyrus McCormick was born, Felix Mendelssohn was born. Some great people, if you study history, all happened to be born that particular year, and yet there was a growing group of individuals that considered it the world's darkest 
year. As Christians, I believe we need to learn to put our faith in the fact that history, history can vindicate our trust in Jesus Christ. Polycarp, a Christian martyr, was put to death about the middle of the second century. Because of so, a a group of struggling Christians were terrified by the persecution under the proconsulship of a man named Statius Quadratus. The historian who recorded the death of Polycarp concentrated on a great truth into a few words when he wrote of the event and attached the date on what he wrote. He penned Statius Quadratus Proconsul, and then he states, Jesus Christ, King forever. He could not possibly have known that nearly 1,900 years later that people might still be reading his words. Some of y'all are wondering, who is Statius Quadratus? Who knows? Who really cares? Because I don't think that's what should draw our attention from what was written at Polycarp's death. Above the turmoil of the world and the chaotic conditions that exist now and have existed through every century since, his affirmation resounds, Jesus Christ, King forever. It doesn't matter the climate of our world. It doesn't matter the struggles personally that each one of us may be going through. The truth of history still stands that Jesus Christ is king forever. Forever. I want you to realize that God is always here. If one were to ask what is the chief appeal of the gospel to so many people in so many generations and in so many countries, I wonder what would you say? What would be your response? Once again, if somebody were to ask you what is the chief appeal of the gospel to so many people in so many different generations and in so many countries? Harry, is it not the influence of the person of Jesus Christ in your life and in somebody else's life? Others have come and gone. Military men have conquered large portions of the world but have had to give it up. Merchants have conquered the market on certain products, but they couldn't, could we say, hold out forever. Entertainers have become a household word, but yet a perish, some of them tragically. Yet Jesus Christ, I'd like to say specifically Christianity, however, is stronger today than it was in the first century. What what do I mean by that? There are more people today that are following Jesus Christ. There are more believers of Jesus Christ today than there was in the first century. We identified this even last week. There are more people proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus Christ today than there was last year, than there was last century, surely than there was in the first century. But for some reason, if we're not careful, we tend to think that Christianity is dying. I got news, the opposite is actually true. The kingdom of God is expanding at a greater rate than it ever has expanded in the history of God's kingdom. Napoleon is reported to have once said, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I built a kingdom on force, yet they crumbled. Jesus Christ built a kingdom on love, and today there are countless thousands who would gladly die for the sake of Jesus. Hmm. Hear me, church. Don't, Don't be fooled by the obvious. Forces are at work for God when we least expect it. There's always going to be doomsayers. There's always going to be people painting this is the worst year in the history of the world, just like they did in 1809, claiming it's never been as dark as it is today. 
do we not believe in God's kingdom? Back to the parable of yeast, they would take just a little bit of leaven that was left over from previous baking endeavors, and they would mix it in, and this, this little bit would change the characteristics of this whole new batch of dough that was being created. What, what Jesus is saying is the power, the power of just this little bit of leaven, how it changes if just a little bit of God's kingdom touches somebody, touches an area, how it can change the course of direction for certain lives, groups of people, and areas. Hear me, don't underestimate the power of God's kingdom power of Christianity. As I begin to conclude this morning's message to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth, a cartoonist drew a little, we'll say, cartoon picture of two men talking in a rural area in the state of Kentucky. In the cartoon, one asked the other, what's new? And the other Gentleman replied, nothing. This is an out-of-a-way out place. He says, but I, I will pass along to you. Last night, there was a new baby that was born over at Tom Lincoln's house. Yet, really, there's nothing new ever around here. I wonder if that same cartoonist would draw a picture of some 2,000 years ago out in Bethlehem. One guy looks to the other and says, what's new? And the other would respond, what, what do you mean what's new? It's just an out of town, out of the way, little city. People periodically pass through. He says, oh, but by the way, I heard some little girl out in one of those stables had a little boy last night. But nothing new really ever happens around here. Who was that little boy but Jesus? And I don't know about you, but he's changed everything in my life. I wonder what he's done in your life. The impact of God's kingdom If I'll just choose to surrender to the leading of Jesus, the working of Jesus within my life. Be careful, church. Be careful about believing that the forces making the loudest noises are the most enduring or the most important. It's usually the silent movements, the quiet, the quiet movements once again, that are usually the strongest. I don't know about you, but I've come to realize God is moving even when it seems like he's not moving. God is working even when it seems like he's not working. Because my Lord never sleeps and never slumbers. He's always working. He's always moving. And I've come to the realization that the kingdom of God is always advancing. There's people's lives continuously being changed. Hear me. If you're not seeing it, then maybe you need to become a brighter light. For God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. He says, so do not be ashamed to testify. Do not be ashamed, in essence, to be the light that God has purposed each one of us to be. We've got to choose to trust him, receiving his death on the cross as a payment for our sins and the sins of others and his resurrection from the grave as our power to experience that eternal life. I wonder, I wonder, maybe maybe you've, you've accepted Jesus as the Savior of your life, but are you still living for Jesus? 
Are you still allowing Jesus to, to direct your steps? Are you still allowing Jesus to lead you through this path of life that he's purposed each one of us? Anyway, because the kingdom is advancing. I said it last week. It's going to advance whether I'm in it or not. It's going to advance whether you're in it or not. The kingdom's going to advance. That's what Jesus is teaching us through these parables. Am I going to be a part of it or am I not going to be a part of it? I'll liken it to this way. It's interesting. This came up after this morning's message, and I had this conversation twice this week. So, you know, when you have this same thought in three different conversations in the same week, maybe, maybe God's trying to get something through. Anybody identify with that? Here, here's the thought that was presented to me three different times or came up in three different conversations this week. We all would identify that God is the Savior of our life, but let me ask the question, is God the Lord of your life? We love for God to be our Savior. I'm not sure we love for God to be the Lord of our life. Just being transparent this morning. There's a huge difference. Does God want to save you? Sure he does. That's why he sent his son, paid the price, and rose again. That you could expend eternity with him. But am I willing to pick up my cross daily and follow Jesus? Hear me, it's not what I want to do. It's what God wants me to do. My prayer is that God's desires become so strong in my life that it is what I want to do. Because I've conditioned myself to allow him to be the Lord. You hear that old phrase, my wife and I just celebrated 25 years. A happy wife equates to a happy life. You've heard it. Where does God fit in there? I just want to live and honor God. I don't want Him just to be my Savior. I want Him to be my Lord. Not just on Sundays, but every day of my life. Him be in the light representative of God's kingdom and positively affecting the darkness that's around us. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning, church?